Okay, so just to recap the code, uh, since we're talking about the model matrix and the transformation matrices, this, well, not this class, but the base matrix class here, I put that one online, so you can find it under other material, under kind of programming samples or, or code samples. And I've put all the base operations there, so you don't need to, if you haven't already, you don't need to write that entire thing up. So what we have here is basically the base float buffer, which is the matrix, and it has 16 numbers lined up like this in the matrix. We have add transformation, two versions of that, just to do uh, the matrix multiplications. So no need to write this entirety or try to copy it out of the videos. You can just find that online. What we have here as well are the push matrix operations, which put the current matrix or a copy of the current matrix on the top of the matrix stack. And the pop matrix, which takes the top of the matrix stack and put, puts it into the current matrix and then throws whatever we have at this point away. So it's a way to just save whatever matrix you had, continue working with it, and then reverting back with pop. We have two versions of set shader matrix. At some point in your program, you need to call set shader matrix with the pointer. But when you call that, it'll store it. So anytime you call this again, uh, it can be called uh, without sending the pointer in. So if you're in a part of the code that doesn't have access to that pointer, if it's already been stored in there, you can call set shader matrix and it'll use the same pointer. So this way, we can ask the matrix to store the pointer to where it's supposed to be in our shader, as we were talking about earlier. And this is the function that actually takes the data that we've built through all the other functions and puts it into the actual shader for OpenGL to use in its pipeline. So that's the matrix class. On top of that, we've implemented model matrix now. Later on, we'll just in a similar way implement view matrix and projection matrix, and then add whatever operations we need for those. Model matrix uh, is basically representing the local coordinates that we're drawing into. All right, I'll stop this here for a moment to look at the vector class itself. <clears throat> it's a simple class, x, y, z coordinates. Uh, it has this function scale that takes a single scalar and scales the entire vector. So what you get out <clears throat> or end up with is a vector that has the same direction, but s times the length. Um, and we have add, so you can add a vector to a vector. It would be nice to add to this something like public float dot for a dot product, taking in another vector to 3D P2, where we'd simply say return x times P2.x. Plus y times v2 dot y plus z times v2 dot z. So here we have a dot product. Yeah, you can add more operations. One nice operation that you could use to get the length squared. Also, we could do a dot self function as well. So that returns length squared, basically x times x Oops. return x dot x plus y times y <clears throat> plus z times z. Uh, it would be nice to make a function like that's called uh, length length and would then return math dot square root of, I don't know if we need to cast that uh, dot self 
since we already have that self here, we can use that. Let's see if complains from cannot convert from double to float, so I'll just force that like so. <clears throat> here we have the length, and you can also add a function called public normalize. Let's say float. Calculate that once and then say x equals x divided by length, and then the same for y <coughs> and z. So there are more operations you could add to the vector class, but you know, these are a few. And then we also have the point class, has the same data here. Uh, simply, there are no operations here. One interesting operation would be an operation public void. We could call it uh, translate or or move or add add take in a vector b. Basically, saying we can add a vector to a point, and we can add vectors together. We can't really add points together. <clears throat> But this add or translate function, we can simply say x plus equals v dot x, and then the same for y and z, and add more operations here that, that work with points. So we have functions here that give us the vector a, which is the x-axis, the vector b, which is the y-axis, and the vector c, which is the z-axis of the local coordinate frame that this particular matrix represents. And then we have get origin, which gives us a point. And that point is then the point of origin or the location of this coordinate frame. So we can access all this data in this way here and use it if it if it works. I use this for instance in the in the drifting of the spaceship in order to have a velocity that is unlinked with the orientation of the spaceship itself. So the spaceship can be pointed one way, but it's drifting another way. And then we kind of take these vectors. When we add to the velocity, we take the b vector, which is the y vector, and we add some length of that direction to our velocity, and then we can get this, this kind of drifting and this updated acceleration. Anyway, so then we have the main functions here, add translation, add scale, and add rotation. And what they simply do is they either multiply the correct locations in the matrix or they make in this case it just does it in the simplest way possible it just builds a rotation matrix and then it adds that transformation using the matrix multiplication there's one thing i added here which is add translation base chords so whereas add translation takes the actual axis of this coordinate frame and uses that to add the translation so for the x-coordinates, it doesn't just add the x-coordinates to the point of origin. It adds the x-coordinates times the a-vector of the frame. And it adds the y-coordinates times the b-vector of the coordinate frame. And the z translation times... So that's what add translation does. Add translation base chords, however, just takes x, y, and z and adds them straight to the uh, x, y, and z translation coordinates of the base coordinate frame. So it's a way for us also to change the location of the coordinate frame in the base coordinate system. So we have two ways to translate. Translating within the local coordinate frame and translating <coughs> relative to the base coordinate system. And the reason we did this was because once we've built the velocity of the spaceship, that velocity was represented in the base coordinate system. So if we wanted to use the velocity to uh, affect the position of the spaceship, we needed to be able to do that in this way. Okay, so now we have a model matrix that can do a few things, have these operations, and we simply need a way to use this. So we're using it in two ways. One of those ways is we're using this static main model matrix here. 
and we're using that as our base model matrix that we send into our shader. So that's the model matrix that OpenGL will be using as our model matrix when we're using the pipeline. And we can see here at inside create. We do here model matrix dot main. So this is just this static reference. Oops. We instantiate it. We load an identity matrix into it, and we set the shader matrix using this pointer, this location pointer to the shader matrix in our shader. So now we've kind of instantiated this with an identity matrix and with uh, with this main model matrix, knowing the location of the shader uh, or the model matrix in the shader that it's supposed to update. Then when we're drawing things, like if we go into spaceship here when we're displaying things we can use this main and we add a scale to that we draw something we add scaling here we have more interesting stuff than that like we add a translation here add a scale as well to draw the kind of wings of the spaceship and so on and so forth. And we're doing this all on the main matrix. And then we're calling set shader matrix every time before we actually draw shapes, before we call something like draw solid square, which actually calls draw arrays, we set the shader matrix. Uh, because adding translations and adding scales, even though this is the main matrix, we have to actually prompt it to go and put that data into the shader. So that's what's happening here. The other way that we're using this model matrix class is what we're doing here. Here we simply set up this orientation, which represents the position and orientation of the spaceship. And we're not setting this up with any shader pointer, because we're not going to send this data into OpenGL. We're just using it as our own positioning. And for instance, if in the update function, if the spaceship is supposed to be rotating left, we add a rotation to this orientation matrix. If it's supposed to be rotating right, we add a rotation to the orientation matrix. If it's supposed to be thrusting, we take the facing out of this orientation matrix, then we add some length of this vector here facing to the velocity. So this is our acceleration here into the velocity. And then in every frame, we add the velocity dot x times delta time and the velocity dot y times delta time. Add that translation in the base coordinates in order to actually move the spaceship. And we do that every frame, not only when we're thrusting, but we want the spaceship to float around even after we drop the thrust so we can uh, yeah, so it keeps on on moving there so in the update we're doing that then when we go into display we actually take the orientation matrix which we've been updating constantly and represents the current position and orientation of our spaceship and we add that to the main model matrix so we say this is our orientation that we have. We start by pushing to save whatever matrix we had when we got into this function. Then we add our current orientation. We don't have to add it as a series of, of rotations and translations and scales. We already did that. So we have a matrix, and we just add it in its entirety to the main model matrix. So now we've got a combined transformation of whatever was already in here, and this added on top of it. Then we start doing the display code here. Add a scale to that. Uh, add some transformations, translations, rotations to that, and draw. Just make sure that there's a push at the beginning and a corresponding pop at the end to make sure that once we end here, whoever called us will still have the same matrix data inside the model matrix. So that's the spaceship. And then here inside this main function, we have two versions of the spaceship. 
we create those spaceships here, sending in some position, we check the input if we're going to the left, rotate left. So we have two sets of input, left, right, up, and down in space. And then we have D, W, uh, A, D, and W, and left shift for the second spaceship. In the update function, all we need to do is just call update on each spaceship, and they know how to update themselves. This is just some code we were using earlier. We take the delta time in the beginning of update, and it's best not to take delta time again, but just kind of send it throughout the rest of our system. And our display function here does a bunch of stuff that we've looked at earlier, but it also just calls display. Calls display on the spaceships, which also know how to draw themselves. So I'm just going to keep going through this. Here we have the orthographic graphic projection that we were talking about. It simply takes these left and right and top and bottom variables and builds a projection matrix that will simply take our window that we're looking through and stuff it into clip coordinates. And the rest of this is unimportant. So spaceship draws itself, then goes through its laser blasts and draws them as well. Inside the fire function, we're just making new stuff, adding that to some vector, and everything knows how to draw itself. If we go into laser blast, again, laser blast knows how to update itself, knows how to display itself. Each blast, it makes sure it pushes in the beginning and pops in the end so that whoever's calling it, which is spaceship in this case, here in the display function, whoever calls it will end up with the same matrix. And what this looks like at this point is this. We have the two spaceships. They can move around independently. If I rotate them to somewhere, then push thrust, they will simply add some length of their current direction to their velocity. And when I release, they just keep on moving in whatever di direction they were going. So the direction that they're moving in is coupled from the direction that they're pointed towards. And then when I hit their firing buttons, they fire shots. But nothing is happening with that. And everything kind of knows how to draw itself. If you feel there's any part of the code at this point that you'd like to see in this short recap, just to have it have a nice way to find it. Can you show me the spaceship self-drawing thing? So the spaceship has a display function. And what it does, it just calls these little, these little, uh, like base graphic functions that we made. We can look at those shortly, like rectangle, rectangle graphic here. And just scroll through that rectangle graphic, the circle graphic one. And just pause the video at any point. Will we ever go into like? Of like using pre-drawn graphics or something like yeah, yeah yeah we'll look at that as well loading models and stuff like that yeah yeah, yeah. okay so time's almost up just because it didn't get a chance before to do all this I think it'd be cool to check out some of these things that I got from the in the first programming assignment. I kind of like this one just because of the color change. It's interesting, but there's a cool one as well. One thing I like in any pro program that you're gonna return to me is speed. If things just happen fast. Both it feels better and more fun and you know it's a bit quicker for me to see everything happen. And we have this. So independent boxes, each with their own color, each with their own direction. So if we go all over the place here. 
they're just the touchscreen input from my from my touchscreen part of my operating system. That's pretty cool. This one is very interesting as well. So to begin with, we have acceleration and velocity rather than so if I push the button it starts accelerating when I release it starts slowing down and I can even have like a little bounce here so I like that and the points that we send out as well have acceleration they all go in the same initial direction but you can do pretty cool stuff if you just constantly add them Gets pretty crowded, but up here, oops. Thank you. Like that. So here as well, I think it, it's a similar idea to the one we saw earlier. Also, it has speed and it has kind of independent boxes. Just went that one step further in the independent boxes actually storing those. But everyone had to do that just to get the mouse input to be correct. Storing a specific location for each box. Here we just have a specific direction and a specific speed and an independent color on each one. And there's one more here that does most of all that, but not quite with stored independent colors, but just with color madness. It's more or less changing the colors all the time. You can change the size. And then when you add more... <laughs> Is the seizure thing working? <laughs> One interesting thing here as well. And it's interesting actually because you can grow them and they always hit the the edge which is cool you can shrink them and if you shrink them too much they actually go back the other way around and and this is an interesting th thing in computer graphics that if you just flip the y coordinates it's just using the other side of the box so now it's using the right side to collide or yeah when we're going to this direction we're going to the right end of the screen it uses, you can see it'll use the left side to collide now, the top to collide, the left side. When we shrink it, what we actually do is just, you know, the left side is now at the right of the, le of the right side. And the bottom is above the top. So it's still using the bottom to collide now. It just goes past. That's pretty interesting. I'll just add a bit of seizure here in the end of this. do that and fairly soon I also want to just look at making full screen applications and stuff like that just to make everything clean but you can do whatever you want here here you have the default windows or you have the, the starting position of the window X and Y and here you have the default starting width and height and one more thing with the input since we were looking at that earlier uh, if we go into the game class here we're implementing input processor then we take all the functions that we can override from that, which are functions like touch down, touch up, and the functions down here, uh, key down, key up, all of these functions. And make sure you don't forget you have to implement input processor. And then somewhere, for instance, inside create, you have to do GDX input set input, input processor to <coughs> whatever class whatever class instance is implementing input processor in this case in this case since we're implementing it in the same class we can say this and then we override all the all the functions and then you have basically keyboard and input callback function so anytime a key is pressed you will this function here will be called anytime a key is is released this input will be called. So it makes it a little bit simpler to, to work with that.